as it's the beginning of camp, uh, don't really have a lot of announcements, but real quick. To the 12-year-old uh, out there that just got your first Wi-Fi pineapple, yeah, that's cute. Stop it. But uh, I guess without further ado, we'll get started this morning. Uh, it's my unique pleasure to be able to introduce a longtime friend of ours up here. Uh, Bunny's been with us for a long time, but absent also for a long time, unfortunately, due to things like geography and whatnot. Space but we're and time. Space and time. <laughs> but we're so happy to have him kick off our conference. It's a great start for the con, so please welcome Bunny to the stage. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks. thanks for having me. I'm like super excited to be back and, uh, and with good friends and uh, in a great location. Um, Dave asked me to sort of come up with a talk about sort of hardware hacking, sort of essentially like the, the hardware hacker book, but in a talk. And so I started thinking about it, and he suggested the title, Making and Breaking Hardware, uh, Origin of the Hacker Ethos. And it kind of turned into more of like why I like hardware hacking and uh, how you can get into it if you haven't gotten to it already. Um, how many people here would say that they're like kind of a hardware hacker or play around a bit with hardware, that sort of thing? Okay, so actually a really good number of people are into it. And how many people would say that they're more of a software hacker? Okay, also a good number of people. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, just, just to get started, I mean, there, there is a valid question of like, does, does hardware even like, matter anymore because we have supercomputers in our pocket and uh, what we can't put in the pocket, we uh, can go to the cloud and, uh, you know, get, had, get whole supercomputers essentially um, at least, uh, you know, sort of through the internet um, via the cloud. If, uh, if we could containerize a teaspoon somehow, um, we would have no more mountains because people would terraform for the fun of it, it seems, <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, and so, like, you know, there is a sort of illusion of possibility that comes from, from software, right? There's a sort of, it's a, it's a bit of a fractal thing. It's like you have an infinite surface area to explore. There's a, a bunch of things you can do. But the, the truth, actually, you know, as with a fractal, is despite the infinite uh, surface area, you're, there's always a finite volume. That volume is bounded by the hardware that, that you're given. So if you were to have you know, an army of men, you could take over countries, you could build pyramids, all this sort of stuff, but they couldn't do the most basic thing for species survival, which is to have a baby, because they don't have the right hardware to have a baby. So don't forget that the hardware is ex actually extremely important. Um, there's some things you can't do without the right hardware. So uh, this, is, this here is a picture of an infrared view of a circuit board. I use this oftentimes to see if I have a problem. Uh, you can find hotspots, and so without that infrared sensor, you don't have visibility into the, that spectrum of light, and that's a very uh, helpful thing to have, um, just to have that one sensor. So this, this is an extension to what you might have on a, on a normal camera. And there's some things that are just easier to do with the right hardware. So you know, if you're trying to hack a system and you have some crypto keys you're trying to extract, I mean, you could build a supercomputer and hook up to a hydro plant and wait many, many years, or you could build a piece of hardware drop it into there and sort of pull out the actual keys themselves. So um, there's kind of two big reasons when I was thinking about it for why you would want to hack hardware. Um, there's basically a security reason, so maybe you want to extract some secrets, and there's another one which is sort of the interaction reason. So this is sort of like extending the capability of a piece of hardware beyond its existing capability. So I'm going to talk about both of those facets um, a little bit. So we'll start off with the security side of things. So why? would you want to go ahead and hack hardware from the security side? So people have gotten better over the years at protecting secrets in hardware, from hardware security modules to sort of like whatever Bitcoin wallets, um, SIM cards, people now sort of uh, putting stuff at the chip level, burning things into e-fuses. These are sort of like uh, micrographs of, of um, what the, the fuses now look like. They're hiding secrets inside of a chip. And so now that people are getting good, really good at burying the secret keys inside of silicon and inside epoxy, that sort of thing, sometimes it feels like uh, the only option you have to get those secrets out would be to build a big supercomputer and a hydro plant and wait a billion, billion years to sort of brute force it out. Um, and that's the point at which you want to go ahead and you want to take the red pill and change the rules, right? Like, you know, we, you, if you exist within the rules of the hardware, you can't, you can't you're, you're just up against a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, impossible computational task to get the, get the, um, the keys out. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Don't worry about the, 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 the list here. I'll talk through it um, in pictures uh, to try to extract um, hardware secrets. So the most obvious thing to do is like direct observation. You can go ahead and you can take a microscope or a scanning electron microscope and look at the piece of hardware. And the cool thing about 
sort of atoms is you can't encrypt them. You can try to obfuscate them, but that's very different from encryption. And so if you get a better microscope, you can basically always find uh, the secrets on the inside. Um, actually, at, at uh, TourCon about 12 years ago or something like this, I was here with a probe station, and we had chips, and we took them apart and showed people how to get the keys out and that sort of thing. Um, it's, actually, it's actually as easy as knowing where to look. The problem is, is that um, when we did the chip at, uh, at the last TourCon, we printed like a 10 by 10 uh, sort of picture of it, and you could actually hold it all there, and you could actually point at the transistors. Of course, today with a billion transistors on a chip, it would be like the size of a city block, and you'd literally have to walk around it for days before you could find where the security keys are. Um, and so there are other ways that are easier um, to get it out. For example, a direct measurement. So this is um, a throwback to a hack I did a long time ago where I pulled the uh, keys out of the Microsoft Xbox. On the left-hand side of the picture here, this is the um, Xbox motherboard, and there's a, some sec secure keys that were held inside the Southbridge chip that were sent to the CPU. And uh, at the time, you know, we, we weren't sure how to, you know, basically brute force the keys out. So I built a little circuit board that, was, that sat on top of the bus and just sniffed the keys out as they went by. And so that's an example of a, of a passive method. So there's no, we haven't really directly modified the function of the, of the computer. We just observed the traffic as it went by. And so this is a little, very simple board that we built and we're able to pull out the, uh, the keys that way. Um, so there are other sort of really cool passive techniques. So it turns out that a transistor, uh, whenever it switches, um, emits a photon in the infrared spectrum. It's a very, it's a very uh, small amount of light, but it's detectable. And so there's a paper that was done uh, which shows this is a picture of a chip in the optical range, and this is a picture of the chip in the infrared range. And as the transistors switch during computation, you actually can see them turning on and off. And so um, they had de demonstrated that um, they were running an AES algorithm and they're able to actually pull out the keys by observing the pattern of lights coming out of the transistors as they switched on and off. Um, this requires a little bit of like a manipulating of the silicon. You have to grind off the backside till it's very, very thin. But it gives you an idea of sort of um, the power that they have now to sort of extract secrets from chips as they're running through these sort of passive optical emissions. Um, if you don't have access to the crazy, you know, microscopes and stuff like that, there's other things you can do, like just observing the amount of power that a chip uses during a computation. So this is a example of, um, so if you, have a, if you have a chip and it's doing a computation, if it has more computation, it draws more power, right? And so if you have a round of AES or a, a, a public key algorithm you're running, depending upon which S-Box you're doing and which part of the key you're doing, you'll have a different signature of power. And this here is a, an actual sort of, uh, picture of a, the trace of the power going through as it goes through different rounds. You can actually see they have a different length of a signature. And so you can actually extract the, the secret through uh, um, observation of a power side channel. And, that, and this is actually becoming so commonplace now you can actually just pick up a, a piece of hardware, the Chip Whisperer, and it has great docs online and teaches you how to do that. Um, there's also uh, RF side channels. So chips, in addition to having power fluctuations and uh, photons being emitted, they'll emit stuff in the radio wave uh, uh, domain. And these sort of round things here are RF probes. Um, you can buy them. They're actually, uh, they're called near field probes. Uh, and you just hook them up to a small amplifier and oscilloscope. And you, and you can get similar traces to the ones you saw of the power if, the, if you can essentially get the chip quiet enough so it's doing just the computation. Or you can do a ton of averaging. That's another thing you can do if you can get a good trigger on it. Um, and so there's a paper here of, of a, a sort of people pulling out uh, encrypted keys for Xilinx bit streams, um, and I, that's where I pulled the picture from. So if, you, uh, if, you, if all else fails on the passive side, you can start to get active. So the ultimate active thing to do is called a focus ion beam. It's a FIB. Uh, that's, this is what it looks like, sort of like a little desktop size machine. And it fires uh, uh, atoms of gallium at the surface of the silicon. And if the atoms are at a high enough energy, they'll hit the silicon and knock it away. If it's low enough energy, the gallium ions will settle onto the surface and create a metallic film. And you can inject other gases in at the same time to do deposition. And so you can see an example here. Uh, this is actually a micrograph of a chip where they've actually cut holes into the chip itself. And they jumpered wired over it and uh, rewired the chip to do something different. So this is actually an example. This actually wasn't a security example. This is someone who just designed a chip and done fucked up. And they had to fix it. <laughs> And, uh, and, they, and, they, and they, they went ahead and rewired it so they didn't have to go ahead and like, pay millions of dollars for the mass set. Um, but the, this type of technology was actually originally developed because making chips is hard and developing chips is hard. Turns out that same technology can be used to um, rewire your chips if you want to go ahead and have them divulge secrets um, when they're not supposed to. 
Um, if you don't have access to a FIP, there's other ways to sort of actively modify the way a chip runs. Um, you can glitch the power, you can glitch the clock, you can glitch other pins like the reset. Um, you can actually, you know, how I said the transistors emit light. Uh, physics has this duality property. Things that emit light can also be sensitive to it. You can actually like shoot a laser at the chip at a very focused location and flip a bit if you want to. Um, these are all these are all possibilities. The, the only problem with light is that actually photons are really big. So like the infrared photons are about a micron in size, and it, as you're well aware, transistors are now like 28 nanometers. And so when you now today when you want to glitch a chip, you're actually glitching like a whole field of transistors. Is what turns out. Um, but uh, fault injection itself is, uh, is interesting. It, um, you know, it, the whole idea is that you go ahead and you just tweak of a chip. Change the, the, so am I, am, I, am I cutting out on the mic? I'm glitching. I'm glitching. Let me see if I can't reposition this. So I, um, there you go. That might be a little bit better. Okay. So the idea is that you want to... Um, try to modify or corrupt uh, the memory or code in some predictable type of way. Uh, so a lot of times, like for example, when you're powering it on, you'll go ahead and as a, as a code is being pulled into the cache, you just sort of glitch power a little bit, and you may be able to flip some bits of code that was supposed to be secure that was going to compute like a branch target or something like this. Another thing is, is as you're doing the actual cryptographic algorithm itself, if you can get just like um, you can get residues out of the cryptographic algorithm that can leak portions of the secret key. So this is a a common attack against um, RSA, uh, particularly implementations that use the Chinese remainder theorem. Or you can just change the reset speed. So like, you know, you can just say, instead of running code from the intended location, it goes from some other place. And this, this picture here is actually, the, the, it's literally called the tweezers hack. Um, this is on the Nintendo Wii, where they have the tweezer between ground and one of the address pins, and during reset, hold it. And so what happens is that the code that was meant to be secure gets loaded into another address bank, and then they can go ahead and execute uh, different code as a result of, the, of, of that hack. So it's sort of like a, a fault injection can be actually very simple. Because a pair of tweezers at the right time hitting reset um, can get you to the point where you want to be. Um, there's also uh, some sort of in-between active and passive. For example, coupling is a, is a new thing that's come out. Um, there's this thing called Brohammer. It's pretty interesting. Um, if you were to look at a uh, DRAM chip, so this is a micrograph of a DRAM chip. These are the these are the row, uh, the row wires that the data is sort of like uh, being read out across. And it, we're looking at one tiny portion of chip. This wire actually will like go from one end of the camp to the other. It's like super, super long. And so when you have two wires that are this long next to each other, they're parallel, go ahead and, 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 and affect each other. And so this is, a, this is an attack where you can go ahead and um, if you have access to two wires that are adjacent to uh, one that holds something that you want to modify, you swing them up and down, you can go ahead and corrupt bits on a page of memory um, through something like this. And so th this is a, a, a relatively new form of um, sort of active attack. And I think there are probably other Rowhammer-like attacks out there that exist, particularly as you start to push into these deep sub-nanometer sub processes, the margins get thinner and thinner. Um, so that should be an interesting um, area to watch in the future. Um, and there's also a kind of an analogy, I guess, for Rowhammer that happens in NAND flash. But because NAND flash has so much ECC on it, um, t typically those things get uh, scrubbed out uh, before they cause any trouble. So that's sort of like the, the security hack. Like that's a, the, the quick summary of why you might want to hack hardware if you want to get um, secrets out. But actually, um, a lot of my time recently has not been so much focused on the security side, but more about extending what computers can do, sort of on the interaction side. What, what can you make computers do that they couldn't do before? I mean, if you remember, if you, without the right hardware, there's some things you just can't do. So you really want to try to put more hardware capability into computers. There's things you can't be aware of. Um, and so uh, it, and in terms of thinking about uh, you know, what you could do with a computer, I came up with a sort of ontology of things. I'm sorry, it gets a little bit <laughs> academic, but that's like sort of my, my tendency. Um, so there's three major areas that I think that you, know, you can divide the, the realm of um, interaction to. There's, Computers interacting with other computers. So that's the, the top bubble here. That would be uh, you know, things like the internet. Your computer interacting with other computers, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, that sort of thing. There's uh, uh, computers interacting with physical matter. That's this bubble over here. And um, I've written sort of like the seven SI units, position, time, mass, current, intensity, temperature, and mole, which is uh, sort of an odd one. But um, the, there, there are sensors and actuators we can use to go ahead and affect physical quantities. So, you know, your earphones turn current into the motion of air. 
a robot arm turns ele you know, electrical impulses into position and mass. Um, we have GPS that tells us position and time. We have optical sensors that can detect the intensity of light over time, so on and so forth. Those form your base set of sensors. And it's really interesting when people develop a brand new sensor, like an infrared sensor or, or something like this, um, that can, can unlock a whole brand new set of functions for computers that wasn't available before. And then on this uh, bubble here is sort of society, how computers interact with society itself. Um, uh, the ways computers can change society is, for example, cryptocurrency or um, surveillance, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, changing the way we feel about um, other people. Um, there's self-driving cars, which can change the way we compute. There are sex robots that change the way we have sex and interact with other human beings. There's uh, cryptography that can limit the, what we can do with our own hardware that, uh, through sort of the norms that we agree in society. And then, you know, maybe in the not too distant future, the, the actual direct human computer interfaces where computers are like literally plugged into our brain and that will be sort of a very interesting uh, time indeed. Um, but, you know, when I was looking at sort of the space of things you can do, an, an observation came up, which is that computers are basically defined by, not by the CPU, but by the sensors and the peripherals you put on it. So for every base, there's kind of like three tiers of computation that I kind of put out here, the sort of like the Arduino level thing, which is embedded microcontrollers. There's sort of like the mobile level, which is sort of like represented by a Raspberry Pi. But also if you look at the Raspberry Pi and, and like an iPhone, they're basically the same sock memory sort of combination on the inside. And then you have sort of the, the desktop server class motherboards. So between those three levels, if you're a hardware engineer and you're, de you're designing it, your schematics are going to start from basically the same spot every single time. And then really it's all about the sensors you put in about it. It's all about the interaction. So these are two different products that actually use the exact same CPU, a PXA-168 from Marvell. I didn't know this at the time, but um, the PXA-168 is used in the Xbox Connect, um, which and is also used in a product I designed called NETV. So and, um, you guys all know what the Connect does. The NETV is a device that allows you to um, put uh, sort of your own, your, inject your own content on top of encrypted video. So it's a sort of experiment to see what we can, how, can, how you can get around sort of the roadblock that DMCA puts on your ability to manipulate video. They both use the same SOC. So that's the, that's the SOC, that's the Marvel SOC. They both have the same kind of DRAM architecture. They might even run the same you know, flavor of Linux, who knows. Um, but then the sensors that, that we put on, this, on the side of that it really changed the, the product overall. I put an FPGA that allows me to interact with encrypted video feeds. They put some amazing um, sensors that allow you to sort of, you know, sort of look at you know, sort of space and measure the distance people are from the camera. And so it's all about that, it's all about the interaction layer that changes, uh, kind of defines what a computer does. Um, another example is you know, the Arduino Omega. Um, this product is in both of these um, devices. One is a power supply, the other one's a 3D printer. Um, it's all about sort of you know, what they do in addition to the core computer at the end of the day. Or like, for example, accessories. So adding or extending interaction. So if you have a phone, which is like this amazing supercomputer in your pocket and it has sensors and it has stuff, there's some things it can't do. Like if you want to measure the wind, you have to get a little thing to plug in and it can measure the wind. If you want to measure your body, there's some sensors that let you interface your phone to your body and measure that. Um, it could be as simple as like a selfie stick, right? So a selfie stick is not a fancy piece of hardware, but the fact that you can now take a phone and put it in a position where you can take a picture of you and a friend un unlocked a whole bunch of new social interaction capability with the phone itself. So there are, there, I mean, you know, kind of hardware hacking can take some very subtle things that just change the way the computers, where they're located or how, they're, how they interact with humans and can create um, sort of new uh, social interaction uh, themes. So interaction is, is where it's at. Um, there's an incubator called Hacks that I um, mentor for in Shenzhen. Every uh, few, a couple months, I see about 12 startups. And I would say like 70% um, of the startups that go through all hinge on the existence of a new sensor or an actuator. So they're not about like, oh, we're going to you know, do a new microprocessor core or something like this. It's more about like, hey, we have, um, you know, we have this new actuator that's actually really good for people who can't walk. So we're going to build like prostheses or we're going to, we have a new um, sort of sensor that's good for measuring the, you know, sort of the temperature of a human that's built a fertility monitor, these sorts of things. These, these are the sorts of stuff that are, are the focus of, of that group. And then I also am a, a research affiliate at the MIT Media Lab, and 90% uh, of the research there is involves sort of computer hardware human interaction, again, so that extending computers, the space of what they can do, and um, 
what's interesting uh, about computers. And if you look at this ontology they put together, a lot of these buzzwords in hardware that, you, that we all talk about are at the intersections of these three circles. So between other computers and physical matter, there's the Internet of Things. Between other computers and society, there's all this AI and machine learning, hullabaloo, you know, vote manipulation and whatnot. Um, there's uh, physical matter and society that's like, you know, um, you know, people 3D printing and, or drones moving things around now, or autonomous cars pushing things around. So, uh, you know, what, ha what happens here at the middle of this? Is it, is it the robot revolution? Uh, what happens? Um, you know, actually, it's, uh, it's the, the right hardware at the right pace can be very simple, but if you can sort of like over, you know, kind of hit that perfecta of, of getting all those different things, you can actually, um, uh, you know, create something very meaningful, but it, it doesn't have to be very complicated. So this, this here is the square which now takes a, a phone, allows it to interact with physical matter that couldn't be for it, i.e. your credit card, to, to other computers, and it changes the way we, we do payment, right? And this very simple piece of hardware, because it sort of you know, hits these three different areas, changes interaction, society, and physical matter, um, and networking, um, uh, has unlocked sort of a new business model, a new way that people can, can other people can do business. So um, given that, you don't have to you know, build a robot revolution to do something interesting. Why aren't there more hardware hackers, right? You know, if it's so compelling, how come there aren't more hackers? Well, going back to that analogy of the red pill and the blue pill, the problem is when you take the red pill, it, you, know, you end up coming out in this like, goopy world, the desert of the real, right? It's not, it's not like you're, you're coming out of that wonderful sim and the dream of the things are. And the thing is, the desert is literally real, right? So like, you know, if you, you know, are in software, you want to get rid of your stuff, arm dash r star, Great, it's all gone, right? This, and then there are actually places in the world where like, it looks like this because of e-waste. This is an e-waste processing facility in Africa where they have you know, a desert that is covered with the stuff that we threw away. We have this abstraction called a, a garbage can that we throw things into. It seems to just disappear. Where do things go? Well, they have to go somewhere. They're atoms. They, they don't just arm dash our star. And so uh, atoms are difficult, and they actually, you know, a lot of times we try to abstract Atoms, we, I mean, the more we can abstract in the belly, that's what Amazon is. Amazon is sort of an abstraction of like, atoms can just appear at my house. That's amazing. But there's like a huge amount of overhead and a lot of um, cost that's involved with creating that abstraction that we, that we all love and, uh, and use every day. So the problem with hardware is that it's made out of atoms. And atoms are really annoying. So atoms <laughs> are owned by people. People like to say that these are my atoms or these are your atoms and I have to protect these atoms and we have to buy these atoms and trade these atoms. That's actually one of the most annoying parts about atoms is that it's not like a computer where I need more computation resources. I go spin up another cloud instance and whatever it is and then if I don't need it, I just turn it off and it goes away. At, you know, if I need more, you know, if you need more minerals or whatever it is, you have to go and mine it and, and, and make it available to, uh, to, build, your, um, to build your things. Um, atoms are imperfect, right? So in, in nature, they don't exist as uh, perfect crystals of silicon. And so there's a lot of effort that we have to go through to align them, position them, put them in the right place to create the things that we want. And after you've gone through all the effort of buying atoms and, and perfecting them and refining them, they just don't move around on their own, right? You can have just warehouses full of atoms that do nothing if you can't get them to the place that people want them to be. Um, on, the other hand, on the other hand, bits are perfect and way more profitable. This is, you know, this is in the, the NASDAQ, you know, sort of valuation to the dot-com boom. If you guys remember that, you know, back in the day of Lycos and Akamai, Alta Vista, uh, the, the days, right? Um, and so what happened during that time of, the, of sort of the dot-com boom is that we end up, people were like, bits are way more profitable, hardware sucks. There's a lot of outsourcing mania that happened during that period of time. So it's in sort of the 1990 to 2008 range, um, there's sort of like this notion of why would you own a pick and place machine when you can rent one, right? So there's, you know, if I have a pick and place machine that's building Blackberries, and another person has a pick and place machine building Motorola Razors, and if, you know, supply and demand isn't balanced on them, well, if we both rented the same machine, they actually are both busy all the time, and so we get more economy of scale by not actually having to own that pick and place machine. And there's also uh, some, some accounting benefits. This is actually sort of, it's interesting to sort of see the, the valuation of Foxconn you know, kind of rise up with the, with the, with, with the, um, the out, outsourcing boom. Um, there, there, there are certain accounting benefits, actually, that actually really drove outsourcing as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about that. So the, there's a cycle that a business goes through where they take money, you buy parts, right? Then you put the parts together, 
you ship them around the world, you sell the parts, you get more money and you buy more parts, right? That's a very, it seems to be the intuitive cycle that you expect for hardware. Um, and this is like a 20 to 60 day cycle and investors who are very clever people like to make metrics and they say, you know, what are your days of inventory and what is your inventory turnover? And that's a measure of the healthier company. Well, it turns out that during the outsourcing boom, people figure out a hack on this where they say, okay, if we don't own the parts and we don't own the SMT machines, we just buy them as they come out of the factory and we just ship them to customers, we can make it look like, like our inventory supply chains are really, 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 really lean. And so at, at, at sort of Apple's height, they actually had a three-day turn of inventory. So it, it, the fiction made it look like you know, they could take somehow, snap their fingers, and three days later, all the inventory is moved. Actually, it turns out all they did is that they would, they would buy the stuff from the factories, they would hold them in a place in Shenzhen very temporarily, and you would then buy it online, and because of the way the counting rules work, if a, if a tracking number is emitted, uh, that's the point which they can say the inventory has been, has been shipped out. So actually, the inventory didn't move. It was brought into a truck into their facility. They signed some paperwork that said that we now own the inventory. Three days later, you bought it online. It could still be sitting there in their, in their factory, but because they sent you a tracking number, they realized the revenue, and, and so on and so forth. So like this, this is how sort of how much the outsourcing has, has moved in terms of, uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the accounting cycle and why people want to get rid of all the hardware. And so currently, you know, Apple is like, you know, uh, sitting at 11 days worth of inventory and the industry is at, still at 70 days because people, some people still own pick and place machines. Um, so there's a whole bunch of outsourcing that happened. People want to get rid of all their hardware. And in, in 2001, there's a sort of strange coincidence. Just going back to the, uh, the Xbox ha hack I did. I was sitting in a... RSC chat room and we're pondering about how do we get these secret keys out and literally there was like the question of like does anyone here remember how to solder anymore? Like we, we've, we, we put those soldering irons aside about a decade ago and we all went to start our companies. Does anyone know how to solder? I like raise my hand like hey yeah I know how to solder I can, I can maybe come up with something. And, uh, and, and that ended up leading to this hack which um, uh, led me to write a book which uh, got me a little bit of notoriety. And then there's this irony of I went to an emerging technology conference because of the work I did there. This is in 2004, where they wanted me to tell people about this emerging technology of hardware hacking. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I mean, like, I, I've been doing this all along. It's not really emerging. You guys just forgot about it. But, <laughs> and, but the, you know, a guy named Dale Doherty was at my talk in 2004, uh, and he says that this was one of the talks he saw in 2004 that encouraged him to do. Um, you know, the Make magazine, which ended up leading to the Maker Fair, which sort of brought out the sort of, this whole site of like Make, Demonym, whatever it is. And then um, Maker Fair gets big and goes to Shenzhen, and um, then there's this huge criticism that happened in the first year in Shenzhen that, you know, this, the, the Chinese, they're, they're not real, they're, it's too much like a trade show, right? Like, you know, what's going on with this, this Maker, you know, Chinese don't get Maker, they're just using it as a trade show, that kind of thing. And then, you know, I sit there and I'm like, is this, you know, is the tail not wagging the dog now at this point in time that we're like criticizing, you know, the Chinese ecosystem for not, you know, being maker enough? And so, and so just, just to sort of calibrate some expectations about sort of Shenzhen, I'm going to spend a couple slides just talking about the, the area. Uh, this is a picture of the electronics district in Shenzhen. And I, 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 I kind of, I guess a lot of people haven't been there yet, but this is, if you can see it, these are like really tall buildings that go back for city blocks. And every single one of these tall buildings is from like ground floor to the spire, full of uh, uh, companies that are involved in hardware. And little small businesses, like mom and pop businesses, that are involved in the trade, design, and, and manufacture of hardware. Um, if you were to go into one of the buildings, this would be a very typical scene. You have rows and rows of stalls like this. And each of these little stalls is kind of like, um, it's actually modeled on the old thing where you would buy fish and meat and it's like a wet market, a Chinese wet market, except people are now, instead of like hacking up pork, they're hacking up iPhones. <laughs> and, and they'll sell you parts and stuff like that. And, and there's like tens of thousands of these little stalls. You can walk in there and uh, you can just, you know, with five bucks, walk out with 10,000 resistors and go to production, whatever it is, cash and carry, um, a tray of chips, whatever it is, this, these are all this is like sort of, sort of the density and the, sort of the fecundity of that the ecosystem. This is a very typical scene. There's a guy here with a bunch of iPhones on his desk and he's just, you know, fixing and reworking iPhones. This is not, this is like not a thing that you'd, you, you always imagine that if you're going to work on an iPhone, it'd be like in the clean room because those things look so immaculate, whatever it is. This is, this is actually what it looks like um, when people work on that stuff out there. And it's, 
to the point where it's like literally in the street there's like you use a little mobile phone just like pouring out of a bag onto the street and people are and it's e-waste and people are going into those things and pulling out parts and figuring out ways to recycle and resell those bits and pieces. So that's that's kind of the, the density of electronics in that ecosystem. And uh, and it turns out that when you have that kind of density of electronics, you can actually like dumpster dive for factories in that in that this is a this is a picture I, I took while I was driving on the highway. This this is a SMT line that's on the back of a truck and they just sort of like put danger tape around it to, to secure it to the truck because whatever, it's a, just an SMT line. Um, and, it, and it turns out that like, you know, if you think about it, you know, you know maybe RIM went there you know, 15 years ago, put a million dollars in to buy a top of the line assembly equipment. They got out of business, that gets sold to scrap for $100,000. A few years later, the next guy goes out of business, sells to scrap for $10,000. And so now you have these tiny little factories that are picking up things that could build mobile phones for like super, super cheap. Um, and it turns out that when it's easy to have a factory, anyone has a factory. This is a picture of a, of a vendor that I actually was working with. Uh, to, I wrote a book about a guide to Shenzhen, and on the back side of it, I want to put these little um, card holders so you can put your samples and business cards, and so I had to get these custom um, sort of plastic sheets that were uh, stamped and molded, and so I actually went to this guy's factory, and it's like this old gentleman here owns these machines, and the young guy in the front owns the printing presses and so forth, and so all these guys just have factories and they just whatever you can go into them and it, lead, it led me to sort of like this insight that the difference between what we have here in America or in the West and what we have going on inside an area like Shenzhen is the difference between inventory and capability so uh, to a little illustrate a bit more let's take the hypothetical case that you want a USB cable and you want a USB cable that's 1.8 meters long exactly 1.8 meters long for whatever reason and you go into Best Buy or wherever it is, and you talk to the gentleman, and you say, hi, hey, I'd like to buy 1.8 meter USB cable. He says, well, we have two meter USB cables and one meter USB cables. How, we, how about you buy the two meter cable and just wrap up the little piece you don't need, put a little twist tie on it, and call it at the end of the day. And you're like, no, I want a 1.8 meter cable. Can you make one for me? Right? And the guy will look at you like you're crazy and says, I have inventory of two meter cables. You should buy my inventory, right? So it's, it's so basically your your space of possibility is defined by what this what the retailers have inventory or are willing to sell you. However, if you go to an ecosystem like Shenzhen, you have people who have rock wire, and they have cable endings. They have this machine here, which is the oval molding machine, and it cuts the cables. And there's a little you know dial you know patty can punch in 1.8. They'll cut the cable to length, put the moldings on the ends, and you can have your 1.8 meter 1.8 meter cable. So this is the sort of ecosystem where you can actually go to a guy and you say like, hi, I want a 1.8 meter cable, I want it to be blue, and I want to have these endings, I want to do this, and they say, okay, sure, how many you want? Okay, you want, okay, just a few, okay, come back tomorrow, and we'll have it for you, right? So that's the difference between an inventory ecosystem and a capability ecosystem. So this sort of notion that hardware is hard is, part, is uh, driven a in large part because uh, the right tools aren't necessarily available for the job. So this is a picture of someone trying to pull off a BGA, um, which is, oh, BGA soldering, that sort of thing, right? And, and there's like blobs of solder and all this sort of stuff, and I have to do a lot of work on the board to clean it up. Right? Well, you know, how do they remove BGAs in China? Well, they, they built these little CNC machines that uh, you can put your motherboard into and correct for, for sort of the, the tilt of the board. And they just literally take a bit down and they mill out the, the chip because it was a bad chip anyways. Why did you want to want to save it, right? And, th and they mill out the chip and you're left with like a clean, they, they mill it just to the point where the solder balls are visible. So you now have the old solder that was there. You don't even have to stencil on a new solder. And you just put the new chip on top and you go ahead and you, and you reflow it. So it's like, it's like, it's actually a pretty cool machine to watch if you can check out the, the, the YouTube video on it. Um, uh, that's, you know, if you have the right tools, it's not that bad. You just have to have that tool. Or another example is like if you have your phone and you broke your screen. People say, oh, I broke my screen. Actually, you didn't break your screen, you broke your touch screen, right? If you notice, like the screen's actually okay. Most of the time, 99% of the time, you've broken the touch screen. When you go ahead and you replace it, they want to charge you like 200 bucks because they're going to sell you another perfectly good screen to go with your $5 piece of glass that was on the touch screen. Well, out, out there, you know, you don't waste any part of the cow. You also don't waste any part of the phone. Um, you know, if you go to China, they have these machines that is, this is a heated vacuum chuck plate. You put the screen down, it heats it up to the point where the adhesive is soft. You have these things that look like nunchucks that have a wire on it, and you pull it across, and it splits the adhesive off between the, the LCD and the touch screen. And then now you have this, you know, sort of screen. You have to bond your, your um, LCD on top, and there'll be little bubbles inside of it. So they have this little vacuum chamber you can put it into that pulls out the air, and then, the, you know, voila, you have, for $5, you now have fixed 
your touch screen on your on your on your phone. And it's and it's because they have like this sort of the right the quote unquote right equipment. You can these are these are things you can go to those markets I was showing you before and you just buy it cash and carry it like it's like thirty bucks for the screen mover and like a hundred bucks for the vacuum chamber or something like that. It's cheaper than buying the whole assembly together with anyways. So um, one other thing is it's like um, uh, uh, another example is sort of chip on board. If you've uh, looked at the back side of some circuit boards, you have like these black blobs of epoxy. They're not actually chips, they're black blobs of epoxy. Those blobs of epoxy are covering um, an actual silicon chip that's unbonded directly to the board with little wires that go to it. And this is, this is done to save cost because packages are expensive, right? So at the super, super low end of things, they do this to save cost. And if you try to do wire bonding in the United States, it's super, super expensive. But then if you do it out there, it's really cheap. And sort of the secret to it is that, um, if I can get this video to play, um, is that they have humans that just go ahead and take the chips and put them onto the board before they do the wire bonding, right? It's, and, and if you can see here, there's actually literally a pair of chopsticks and part of a, it, it, this is a box cutting blade. It's actually not even like, in the, what they did is they just wrapped it in tape so they don't cut themselves when they use it. And they, and they go ahead and they slice off the chopstick to the right angle and it has enough surface tension that it can sort of like, you know, pick and place them onto the board and that sort of thing. And so a lot of people, I show this to people and people go like, like what, it's not all done by robots? I mean. Freaking Tony Stark has a robot to put his robot armor on, so like, why don't we have, like, you know, robots doing this sort of thing? And it turns out that you know, manual skills are still skills at the end. Of it. This is another. This is another picture of a of a of a, of a woman who's building um, prototypes for uh, for me, and she's just taking BGAs and putting them onto the board by hand. She just sort of sticks it down, looks at it, and then puts another BGA down, sort of nonchalantly. And I and before I actually saw this with my own two eyes, I was like. There's no way, right? This is not something a human can do. And then, and then I was like, okay, maybe I should try it, right? And I try it. It's actually, actually surprisingly easy to do. It's not that hard to, to, to put BGAs on and to, to reflow them down. And so, um, you know, not everything has to be done by robots. A lot of it can be done by humans. And having this big, huge base of people who can do stuff is really important to create a diverse ecosystem. So if you look at sort of the, the, the sort of ecosystem in China, it started as a bunch of raindrops, right? Um, billion of people, 1% of them went to go work as assembly laborers who then became technicians and engineers. 1% of them become managers and designers. And then now today we're looking at like, oh my God, where did Xiaomi and Tencent and Taobao and Alibaba came, came out of nowhere, right? You know, this is crazy, China. Um, it's just, they have this enormous ecosystem of people to support this um, capability. Whereas what happened, um, if you were to look at analogous timeline in the United States, you had these engineers who invested a lot of money in the Cold War to create because we had to fight, you know, the evil Russian powers or whatever it is. And they built amazing things. We sent, you know, people to the moon and stuff like this. And then the dot-com boom happened and we're like, well, screw the soldering irons. We're going to go and make money, you know, selling computers. And there's this sort of like decade of where we tried really hard to push everything to China. And then we, you know, sort of this rediscovery of the maker movement happening. Um, and people saying like, oh, hardware um, is hard. Um, but it, it turns out that actually it's not hard if you have the right ecosystem. So these wonderful phones that you see, we, we oftentimes focus on the system integrator, like an Apple or a Foxconn or something like that. And we think that, yeah, Apple makes the phone or Foxconn makes the phone. Actually, Foxconn puts the phone together, right? The, and maybe they they put the parts on the board, but like, you know, there's people who do the metal stamping for them, people who do the injection molding, people who do the test jig, people do all these different pieces. There's a huge network of, of factories that feed into it, that go through sort of that trade district of the, of the, of the electronics area to feed the, 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 the factory to go ahead and do these sorts of things. And so you need to have that sort of rich mulch to, to have a, a, you know, a, a, a healthy forest at the end of the day. Um, now the problem with ecosystem loss is that, is that if you are in an ecosystem system that has lost capability, you can't even describe what things look like. So, you know, what do, di what do dinosaurs look like? They've been extinct for a long time. A lot of time, a lot of time we thought they were scaly creatures, but maybe actually they have feathers, right? We don't know. We actually can't even draw what a dinosaur looks like. We, ha we all have the canonical thing that we think it looks like because of Jurassic Park, but that may be completely <laughs> detached from the reality of what actually d dinosaurs were. Or for example, like, you know, dodo birds, right? Here's a picture. Which one of these birds is the dodo bird, right? You know, we haven't seen a dodo bird in years. We don't know what, which one a dodo bird is. Turns out the one on the left is the dodo bird, but a lot of people think it's the one on the right. Um, 
And so, uh, and so ultimately the issue with ecosystem loss, you end up with the situation here is like, well, of course everything's done by robots because that's what we see in the movies and that's our impression of how things should be done and therefore like, you know, hardware is hard, we don't have the robots, whatever it is. And it's actually, you just need to sort of practice and get your skills up and you can, you can, you can do it. And of course the other problem with ecosystem loss is a few people who are, are playing in the area can go ahead and uh, create a monopoly around it and uh, create further barriers for people to go ahead and even get started. Um, so, but despite all that, the really good news for people who want to get into hardware is that hardware kind of doesn't change. Physics hasn't changed since a very, very long time. There's no like <laughs> physics 2.0 that has forced me to go ahead and reformat my oscilloscope and my soldering iron and I have to like throw it all away because I'm not compatible with the new phys physics ABI, right? <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, humans, which is the other half of why we build hardware, they also haven't changed fundamentally. I mean, we, we, you know, we still have two arms and two legs and we have the, our desires and our, and our fears. And so the good news is if you consider, you know, the study of hardware and how it interacts with humans, there's a, there's a, there's a limited space of things you actually have to learn and it's, and it's cumulative. It just goes up. So like if you look at the programming language I've had to learn, right, basic C, assembly of various layers, uh, assembly of various flavors, C++, Pascal, Perl, Java, Python, JavaScript, Rust, Verilog, VHF, Bash, Go, you know, it just goes on and on. So it seems like every freaking year I turn around and it's like, another framework that I have to learn? Another language? Like, the, what are the cool kids doing today? Uh, you know, the equations I had to learn for hardware, I learned in college and they haven't changed. There's Maxwell's equations. I actually had this compressed down to just Maxwell's and fixed first law, but I said be generous. And that, like, Maxwell's is four equations, Gauss's law, Faraday's, and Peer's law. Um, you learn those, and the, it turns out Ohm's law and kirk elskert law are just derivatives of Maxwell's. And fixed first law, which, which teaches how um, um, carriers diffuse through silicon. And so you, you learn those two things together, and now you know how a transistor works. And then everything builds up from there, right? You just, it, it's hard to learn those things, but once you learn them, they've served me for my entire life. I had, there's no Maxwell 2.0, there's no, you know, um, things that change on these sorts of things. And so like, you know, also the hardware tools I had to learn hasn't really changed much either. Like software tools, <laughs> just like initd, systemd, busybox, open embedded, make pip, app, young, conda, docker, Jenkins, Travis, GitHub, blah, 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 all, the, all these different frameworks. Like, you know, I can't even keep track of the frameworks that I have to learn to keep a simple web server running these days, right? It seems like, like every, every year, I, all I want is I want to have a web page that's, that shows some static content or something, and, I, and I'm constantly having to go back and take care of that thing. Um, you know, hardware tools, I learned how to solder. I learned a hot air gun. That's basically the tools you have to learn and learn how to use them well. Um, I got generous and said, you also should know how to use a microscope and oscilloscope and a spectrum analyzer. And that's kind of like it for the actual bench tools. And then if you want to actually design the hardware, there's some software packages you need to know. And those things are uh, surprisingly stable too. So if you're going to do board design, pick your, pick your poison, Altium, Eagle, whatever it is. But it's not like, you know, Altium isn't good enough and you have to switch. So all these different packages, you pick one, you stay with it, and they're good enough for you to go with. SolidWorks for 3D design. If you want to do actual silicon design, maybe there's Cadence, Magic, and Synopsis. And that's, that's like it. Like I've kind of described the world of hardware tools that you've had to learn. So it may be a little bit difficult. The learning curve may be a little bit hard, but once you walk up the curve, um, you actually get up the mountain. So it's, you know, Harvard might be hard, but at least it's not Sisyphean, right? It's, you know, it's not. Right. <laughs> People got this one <laughs> in this crowd. Uh, you know, the, the old story of Sisyphus where, you know, he's cursed to carry up a rock to the top of a hill only to watch it roll down again. That's what I feel like every single time I have to learn a software framework. Um, at least when I, you know, do my hardware stuff, I'm like, okay, today I'm going to learn how to reball a BGA. You know, that, I, it, that took me a day and a few bad BGAs, and now I know how to reball a BGA. It hasn't changed. I can, a BGA can do it again uh, 10 years later. So getting started, the basics are surprisingly cheap. This is a snapshot of my workbench, my wonderfully messy workbench in Singapore. Um, basically everything in that, in that photograph, I uh, got on a trip to Shenzhen, put it into my suitcase and checked it and carried it for about 500 bucks, um, including the microscope, the hot air gun. So that's the microscope, the hot air gun, soldering iron. There's a little hot air plate that I use to serve as cheat mode. Um, this one here is expensive. This is the multimeter, but that's because I really like lots of digits of precision on my multimeter. You don't need five digits of precision. It's just I have an obsession <laughs> with very precise measurements. Um, there's some cool things you can do with it. Talk to me later, but you know, we, that's 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 for that's for me to sort of 
my, my porn. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, and then getting it started in hardware, if you want to sort of start playing around stuff, the dumpster diving is a really good way to get your hand on things. And of course, as I alluded to in China, it's very easy, but there's facilities in, um, in this ecosystem, uh, like eBay and Craigslist, uh, that have lots of stuff you can, uh, equipment you can buy. Uh, plus, uh, local universities and institutions tend to throw you a lot of really amazingly good stuff. Uh, um, you know, when I was uh, at MIT, I would sort of routinely cruise the reuse list where they would throw away equipment and you would get like top notch you know, multimeters and, and soldering irons to the lab just to site. The grad student graduated, left the equipment behind, and now they're throwing it away. So guess what? Like you, you can you can have it too. Um, so the dumpster diving cycle basically is this virtual cycle. You get equipment, you fix the equipment, you learn how to use the equipment, right? Then you get more equipment that might be a little bit harder, but then it may be a little bit borked. You fix the equipment, and now you can use the equipment to fix even better equipment. And so, and again, it's, it ratchets up. It's not like an investment that goes away. It's not like I'm going to write a framework to make another framework to do another framework, and then someone tells you, oh, we left those frameworks behind a long time ago. It's now the cool thing is now whatever distro that you know, pick you know, today. Um, so it, it, it does ratchet up. And also in the process of fixing things, you can learn through reverse engineering. So this is I, uh, on my blog, bunnystudios.com. I, I run a competition called Name That Where. And the reason why I do that is I want to people to encourage people to look at hardware. People say, how do you get started in hardware? It seems so hard. The first thing you do is you just look at it, right? I mean, there, there are patterns you can learn. There's things that are really interesting, things you can get out of it. You may not understand it today, but because the, the, the themes, the motifs are consistent, if you get those, those patterns in your head, um, when you see something's different, your, your eyes drawn to it and you say, why? So like, you know, there's this really weird white thing sticking out here. This is actually a picture of the inside of my five digit multimeter. Um, and uh, and that's, that, that is, that is the, that's the really ultra high precision resistor they use for, uh, for um, setting uh, as a reference standard for, for, um, for the measurements. And so, and so you, you, you're drawn to these things, you look it up and you learn about these things and you say, oh, that's a really cool technique, that's how they do it. And then you, and now it's another little fact that you put in your head, you hang it in the tree and it stays there and it, it doesn't have to go away or go bad. The next thing is there's the fear of failure, right? People are often <laughs> like, but what if I break it, right? What if I avoid the warranty? What if I, you know, this sort of stuff. The thing is, the truth is, I break hardware all the freaking time, right? So if I'm gonna hack something, my rule is I, I get one to break, one to hack, and one to test, right? And so you, you want to get a piece of hardware that you can just completely trash, take all the parts off, whatever it is at the end of the day. So if I'm gonna hack a phone or something like this, I'll, I'll go to eBay, find a broken one, and then I'll just start taking the parts off. Like, you know, where, you know, where are the parts that I shouldn't be putting my probes that would break things, right, um, later on down, down the road. Oftentimes all you need is just one sample like that and you just, you just completely trash it, right? You learn a lot doing that. So now, now that you've, you've learned what not to do, you get the piece that you actually do the hack on, right? So this is, this is back to that piece where I installed that, that motherboard, that, the, the tap board inside the Xbox. So when I had the Xbox, I had one Xbox from a broken one that I took all the parts off of to sort of figure out and I measured where the, the, the trace pitch was and then all I had to do was build one on the Xbox I actually had to hack it. And then I could always find a friend's Xbox to just check to make sure things were going well if things weren't working on my side. So, and it's important to have one to check because you know, a lot of times it's easy for you to think that you're crazy or you're not, you're, you're not thinking straight. You just wanna say, okay, is it working or is it just me, right? And so there's a rule of threes for hacking. One to break, so sort of minimize that fear of failure, the fear of loss. One to hack, we do the experimentation on, and one to check, sort of the base, uh, a baseline to ground your experiments. <laughs> for making, there's a kind of a similar um, pattern to it. So you, know, you look at a phone, you take it apart, you're like, wow, it's like so immaculate and put together and so perfect. Like it seems impossible to build these things of such complexity. It turns out they, it's a multi-stage process too. Phones start not as tiny little phones. They start as really big boards. This is an example of a Qualcomm dev board. This is just a bezel with a screen, right? And then this is the actual CPU that's on a card that you can swap in and out in case you break it or something like this or you want to change it to another one. And you have this huge array of connectors for yourself to plug in diagnostics and peripherals and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, there's a multi-stage process to making these complicated things as well. Uh, there's a, in the industry, there's a, there's, a, there's a terminology for it, the EVT, DVT, PVT process. So VT stands for validation test. The E is engineering. So you, your first step is, does it catch fire? 
right? <laughs> if it doesn't catch fire, then you have a design. And you say, does design meet our requirements, right? If it meets requirements, great. Let's try to produce it. Does it yield, right? That's sort of the three basic uh, stages. And the observation is that, like, the build materials stays 80% the same through all the stages, ideally. I mean, hopefully you're not, like, you know, at stage two and a product manager comes in and says, actually, we need to, like, put a, you know, a coffee maker inside your phone. So now, okay, <laughs> great, throw everything away, start over again. So that, accepting, you know, sort of Dilbert mode um, sort of changes, um, things don't change too much. So usually what you do is you buy 10 or 20 parts at the beginning, and keep in mind that parts are cheaper by the dozen, so you're not actually buying, you know, 10x or 20x the amount of cost, and a lot of it's a setup fee. And so if I'm, if I'm going to do like an IoT style, like you know, single board, you know, embedded microprocessor kind of project, at the EVD stage, I'll build a minimum of three, because you want to have one to break, you know, one to test, one to check, right? So that you're actually kind of at the very first stage, you're hacking your own design because you, it's not working. Okay, what do I do? Okay, well, let's try to reverse engineer my thought process and figure out, and uh, you attach the JTAG debugger, and you finally get code loading, and you're actually kind of owning your own hardware at the very beginning because it's not booting. Um, so that's sort of like the, the does it catch fire stage. And then once you're to that point, you want to build a few of them so you can start handing them to other people to, you know, check your design assumptions and also put them in, you know, machines to bake them and shake them. And then uh, to the production side, you want to build as many as you can afford so you can, like, give it to friends and actually do, like, a soft beta to see how things are going. So this is some exact actual examples of how this uh, comes along. This uh, uh, product I made. Uh, a long time ago called the Chumbi. It's basically a squishy little Internet of Things alarm clock. Um, at the end of the day, this is what it looked like at the end, but it started as like this large board on my desk, and then to see if it would catch fire, um, literally, we, we got some squishy pillows and some Hello Kitty things and cut them open and then like put the circuit boards on the inside and ran them for a long time. So it literally does it catch fire was like the, the EVT stage of, of, the, of the project, right? Okay, great, it doesn't catch fire. Let's go ahead and try to refine the design and stick into something and then we figure out like actually the, you know, this original design was bad, like the electronics would fall out, there's all kinds of small problems. And then finally once we hammer out those kinks, we get to the production stuff which is end up being photographed and people, you know, that's what people talk about. But like there's a lot of, the, but it was a process getting to there, right? And it's a well-defined process. And the key thing is it doesn't happen if you don't try. You just need to sort of get started and, and give it a try um, to make it happen. So in another example of a, um, a project I work on is Chibitronics. So Chibitronics uh, is a project where we put electronics onto paper. Uh, it, it's sort of an interaction of sort of physical matter and people to get see how people can learn and, and create differently if they have electronics integrated with paper. Um, it kind of looks like this. You have uh, stickers that we can put down onto paper, and we have like clippable microcontrollers that can go on the edge of a page, and you can like and then draw on top of it, do art, that sort of thing. Um, so it, you know, there's a lot of problems that we had to solve getting to that. In the very first prototypes, were literally just like a large flex PCB that we just put everything that we could think of it on it, like just stupid stuff. We had like accelerometers and microphones and boost regulators and battery, all the sort of stuff, right? And, and huge chains of high power LEDs. And we saw like what caught fire and what didn't catch fire, what worked and what didn't work. And we sort of winded it down to a space of things that we could reasonably produce. And then for the clippable paper stuff, it literally started with a paper clip that we like taped a board on and then like stuck some foam behind and said, oh, hey, this might work, right? You know, this, that's, that's the EVT stage. That's where it all starts. We, you just have to try and see how it goes. And then we uh, matured it to a DVT stage where we did a, a small crowdfunding campaign on some early stickers and some 3D printed models to sort of refine the clip. And then um, after about a year of effort, we end up with these, you know, oh, sorry, what you see now, like on, on Amazon or wherever it is, or the actual product, it, you know, looks finished and refined, but, it, but it's not, you know, it's not like it was just born that way. Or another project that uh, I'm working on called NETV2. Uh, I, I mentioned the earlier NETV, uh, which sits kind of at the intersection of other computers and society. Society says that it's bad for you to uh, break crypto. Um, that's a crime today. You're not allowed to go ahead and um, uh, circumvent crypto to access copyrighted materials. Um, and NETV2 tries to um, uh, challenge that notion. Um, and so the basic idea of NETV2 is that if you have a Raspberry Pi, you have an application you want to show on your TV, you can go ahead and just, you know, plug it in line with your cable on the TV, 
And then whatever shows up you know, on your Raspberry Pi is now uh, like a little window on the side on your TV. You can do sort of like a video overlay. And the reason why it uh, sort of uh, uh, sits on the intersection of society is that there's actually a law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which makes it illegal uh, for you to go ahead and um, hack, um, uh, play around with the video feed. So if you want to do something even really simple, like what you can do with your phone, where you want to go ahead and do live video translation of, of text on the screen or something like that, that's actually not lawful to do right now um, on a TV feed because those things are encrypted. Um, so when I first started the project, this was the EVT1, I thought maybe I would build something in like a little PCI, uh, mini PCI Express card form factor. And I floated around and you know, you know, did a catch fire and built some stuff for it. Turns out it was kind of, I completely missed the mark. Um, like went back to zero again and EVT2 looks a bit more like this. It's actual full size PCI card because that's you know, where people actually had the power to do the video and where the interest was in the market. Um, evolved it into a DVT prototype with a 3D printed case and the Raspberry Pi mounted on it to see, you know, and where uh, that's currently actually at the stage it is right now. Uh, what the PVT will look like will actually be the outcome of, it's actually an active crowdfunding campaign, shameless plug. If you go to crowdsupply.com, alpha max slash netv2, uh, you can check out more details about this project. But the, but the idea is that, like, you know, based upon the feedback of people, the users, and what people want to do with it, the PVT will come into shape. So this is actually that process happening live. Um, and you can participate in this process through the magic of crowdfunding. Um, so you know, the high level sort of message I'm trying to get out here is that you know, hardware is interesting. And hardware isn't hard if you know the method. right? So just you know, hacking as a methodology. You get a couple pieces, one to break, one to hack, one to test. It's not, it's not scary. Um, if you wanted to do making, there's also a process. Right? Does it catch fire? Right? Does it meet specs? And can it yield? And if you can um, hack hardware, you can go ahead and bring new capabilities to the things you can do, whether on the security space, if you want to go ahead and pull out keys, or if you want to extend the interaction and capability of a computer. Um, and this ultimately is sort of like the core of the hacker ethos, I think. When I was thinking about this talk, it's about redefining your volume of possibility. It's not being caught in that sort of infinite fractal surface area and thinking, wow, like but there's so many things for us to look at. Let's just change the rules and change the volume of possibility so you have uh, literally a blue sky of, of ideas that you can go ahead and explore. And that's my talk. Enjoy the camp. everybody. Uh, I really look forward to hanging out with you guys and getting really trashed tomorrow soldering. <laughs> <laughs> Should be a really good time. See you around. Oh, that's right. I think they wanted to arrange like a book signing or something like that. I don't, I've never done one of these, so if you're interested. <laughs> sure. <laughs>